Hey everybody, this is Mr. Bortnick for AP Calculus AB, Unit 1, Limits and Continuity. Uh, today we're doing review for the Chapter 1 test. This is the first part of the review on sections 1.1 and uh, through 1.9. Enjoy! All right, so this is the first of our two review sessions for Chapter 1. This particular topic that we're focusing on is Lessons 1.1 through 1.9. Um, as this states at the top, reviews do not cover all the material from the lessons, but will hopefully remind you of key points. To be prepared, you should study the packets and notes from Unit 1 so that you are ready for our Unit 1 test. Uh, let's get started. So a salesman tracks the number of cars he sells through the Model C where C of M is, number, is the number of cars sold and M is the months for M is between zero and 24. So what does C of 10 represent? So in this case, we're saying again, C is the number of cars sold uh, and M is the month. So in this case, C of 10 would be the number of cars sold in the 10th month. So the number of cars that are sold in the 10th month. Next question, what does C of 16 minus C of 8 over 16 minus 8 represent? Uh, this looks like it's in the form of Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, which makes reminds me of a rate of change. And so rates of change are really important, right? That's like a slope. Uh, and so in this case, the question is, you know, what is it a rate of change of? Uh, in this case, it looks like an average rate of change because I see that it is going between 16 and 8, t equals, uh, or rather m equals 16 and m, equ m equals 8. So in this case, it would represent the average rate of change, the average rate of change of the number of cars sold between months 8 and 16. So the average rate of change of the number of cars sold between months 8 and 16. Now again, I knew that this was an average rate of change here because I saw that it was in this form of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and I saw that there was a bit of distance between these, right? These numbers are not particularly close to each other. This isn't trying to do an instantaneous rate of change, uh, it's just finding that average rate of change. And so that is uh, telling me that piece. Here though, in number three, we do see two uh, values of m that are really, really close to each other. In this case, it looks like not only is this a rate of change, right, because it still is in this like form of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, but these numbers are really, really close to each other. So in this case, I would definitely say that this is uh, doing an instantaneous rate of change. So that is the rate of change at exactly a certain time. And so in this case, it looks like it's they're both these values are really close to seven. So because of that, we're gonna say that this is gonna be an estimate, because it's not exactly the rate of change, but it's an uh, estimate of the instantaneous rate of change of cars being sold per month when, or not, I'm gonna not say when, but on the seventh month. So an estimate of the instantaneous rate of change of cars being sold per month on the seventh month. So again, uh, comparing these this is an actual value, so it's telling us that number of cars sold in the 10th month. These two are rates of change. So they're telling you on average or uh, at that exact moment, what is the rate uh, of the cars being sold. All right, so let's get into some uh, problems where we're evaluating limits. Looks like we've got a, a good series of these uh, going from four to nine. Here they're not really saying uh, what method we need to use. Um, and so I'm gonna approach all of these either algebraically or numerically. We're just sort of assuming that I don't have access to a calculator uh, for these particular ones. So let's get started with number uh, four. 
Um, first off, you know, our go-to method always is to make sure that we uh, try direct substitution. If I do that with my direct substitution, I'm going to see that this is the square root of 19 minus the square root of 19 over 0, which is 0 over 0. So the fact that this is indeterminate form sort of tells me that I need to uh, do something in order to simplify this and factor it. Uh, to hopefully get some canceling and, and see if we can get that actual value. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to say that I've got the limit as x approaches 0 of this square root of x plus 19 minus the square root of 19, all divided by x. We're going to multiply by the conjugate. So I'm going to multiply by the square root of x plus 19 plus the square root of 19, and that's going to be multiplied in both the numerator and the denominator. Now that I've got that set up, uh, if we were to do an expansion box for that numerator, we would see uh, that the numerator would simplify to become x plus 19 minus 19. And then in that denominator, we've got x times this whole square root of x plus 19 plus the square root of 19. And again, how did I get this up here? That is by multiplying these two terms by these two terms uh, in an expansion box. And so that would, we'd have some square roots canceling out. That's sort of the magic of multiplying by the conjugate. Um, and so now we see actually that our 19 and negative 19 are going to cancel, leaving with just an x in the numerator. And that also means that this x is going to cancel with this x down in the denominator. So after we do that, we're going to be left with the limit as x approaches 0 of just 1 in that numerator being divided by the square root of x plus 19 plus the square root of 19. Now that we've done some canceling and we can't really cancel anything out, I'm going to go back to trying direct substitution. I'm going to plug that 0 in for x. And if we do that, we're going to get that this is equal to 1 over the square root of 19 plus the square root of 19 aka 1 over 2 squared of 19. And again, if I wanted to rewrite this so that it did not have a, uh, rational, a radical in the denominator, uh, we can multiply here by the square root of 19 over the square root of 19 to get our final answer, which is the square root of 19 over 2 times 19, which would be 38. That would be our simplified uh, answer for this problem. That would be the limit for problem number four. Um, again, sort of in this step, if this were the AP exam on the free response section, it would be fine to leave your answer like this. But if this were, say, the multiple choice section, they would definitely never leave a radical in the denominator. And so it's good habit to, to go that extra step and, and uh, take the square root out of the denominator by multiplying by that radical in the numerator and denominator and then simplifying. This is an answer that I would see on the multiple choice section. All right, let's try number five. Uh, as we previously said, first things first, let's try doing direct substitution. Let's see what happens. So if we do that, we've got negative three plus three is being divided by negative three squared plus two times negative three minus three. Uh, that looks like that's gonna be equal to zero over what, nine, Minus 6 minus 3, that's that's equal to 0. Um, I don't want to say that this is equal to 0 over 0 because we would never say that it actually equals to it. That's something that could lose us points on the AP exam. So I'm going to use those arrows just to show that uh, we did the direct substitution there. But what can we do with this function? Well, looks like we can factor the denominator. We've got that x plus 3 already in the numerator. If we factor that denominator, it looks like we can factor that into an x plus 3 times an x minus 1 to give us uh, that denominator. And then of course, we're gonna see that these uh, x plus three factors cancel each other out. So we are gonna be left with the limit as x approaches negative three of one over x minus one. And then we're gonna go back and do that direct substitution piece. So that negative three is gonna go in for our x. So this is gonna be one over negative three minus one. And so that is gonna be one over negative four or negative one fourth for our answer for problem number five. Number six, ooh, special trig functions. Um, in this case, remember that the sine squared of uh, x or sine squared in either of these cases is telling us that that whole sine of three x is being squared. 
So technically what we've got here is that this is equal, this is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of sine of three x times the sine of three x all divided by sine of five x times sine of five x. And so we could of course uh, do our direct substitution and if we do that, we would have sine of zero times sine of zero and sine of zero is zero. So I would actually have indeterminate form. I'd have that zero over zero in the denominator. Um, and so because this is going to uh, indeterminate form, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna see if I can get anything to cancel out. Now, just a heads up as to what this is uh, going to. We know that uh, from earlier in this chapter that there's a special trig function when it is the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x, that goes to one. That is one of our special trig uh, values. And so I'm going to use that in this problem because I see that this is a limit that's going towards zero and I see that it's got some signs involved and, and things didn't cancel out. So how can we rewrite this function? Well, we can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches zero. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually split this uh, split this fraction up into four different pieces so that they look more like this uh, special trig function that we've got. And so if I do that, that's going to be uh, sine of 3x, which is being divided by 1, times sine of 3x, which is being divided by 1, times 1 over sine of 5x, times 1 over sine of 5x. So all I did was split that numerator and denominator actually up into four different fractions so that they're a little bit more into this uh, form. Now, also a reminder, uh, I guess I'll go back uh, to, to these rules. One of the rules also said that the limit as x approaches zero of x over sine of x is one as well. So that's gonna be, both of these are gonna be useful because we can sort of see that this is pretty close to this form, and this what that we've got right here is pretty close to this form. Now, what is missing? Well, we notice that for this rule that we've got here, sine of x over x, if we're gonna be able to take this shortcut and use this special trig value, whatever we have inside of the sine needs to be also in the denominator. And that's true for over here, whatever's inside of our sine function needs to be in the numerator if we're gonna be able to use this. So. I need to think about what can I multiply each of these values by in order to get uh, this exact same 3x in the denominator, then this 5x in the numerator, and that's gonna be true for each of these four. Well, for this first one, I'm gonna multiply by 3x in the numerator and the denominator because in order to keep that fraction the same, we need to do multiply both places. I'm gonna do that also in the second fraction so that 3x can be in the denominator. Here I'm gonna multiply by 5x in the numerator and denominator, and then 5x in the numerator and denominator. So by doing that, uh, what's gonna happen? Well, essentially, this piece, so let's get, let's get orange. The sine of 3x over 3x is gonna become one. And so if we do that, this, this limit as a x approaches zero is gonna leave us now with just 3x for this piece, and it's gonna be just this 3x that's left over. Similarly, using that rule, this sine of 3x is going to cancel with that 3x in the denominator going towards that limit of, uh, of 1 that we've got right here. And this term is going to also go to 3x because that's what's left over right here. Our 5x and sine of 5x are going to be in this form. That means that that limit is going to 1, but this 5x is left over. And so canceling out those pieces, we're going to be left with a 5x in the denominator. So that's a 1 over 5x. And then similarly, our 5x and sine of 5x are going to, are going to go towards a limit of 1, leaving us again with that 1 over 5x. So we used essentially these special properties of limits by taking the inside of that sine function and making sure that that was in the denominator so that that limit can go towards one. Now, since we're multiplying, we would multiply across. This looks like that this is gonna be equal to nine x squared divided by 25 x squared. Those x squareds are gonna cancel and we get an answer which is nine over 25 for problem number six. Number seven, uh, I encourage you for these absolute value problems, if you don't have access to a graph or if you're not thinking about how the graph of this function looks, we know here that this is the limit as x approaches two from the left side. 
I encourage you in these types of problems to go just straight to the numerical interpretation of it. Let's pick a number that's slightly less than two. So I would pick like 1.999 and see what happens. If we do that, we've got 1.999 minus two, or that absolute value of that, divided by that 1.99 minus two. Uh, so that's gonna be equal to the absolute value of negative 0.001 divided by negative 0.001. That absolute value is gonna work its magic in the numerator and make that equal to a positive 0.001 divided by that negative 0.001. And these numbers are the same, so when we divide them, that's gonna give us one, but a positive divided by a negative gives us a negative. So this is gonna to go to negative one for problem number seven. Number eight. Uh, Let's think about, again, I would do direct substitution first, plugging in that x for each of these. If we do 10 squared minus 5 times 10 minus 50, all divided by 10 minus 10, we've got about 100 minus 50 minus 50, that's 0. 10 minus 10 is 0, so this is indeterminate form. That tells me, again, I should be going and continuing on this problem. So let's factor. Uh, if we do that, this is the limit as x approaches 0 of what looks like x minus 10 times x plus five, if you factor that numerator, and that's being divided by x minus 10 in the denominator. Here, our x minus 10s are gonna cancel each other out, so this is equal to the limit as x approaches 10 of just x plus five. We're gonna plug in that, that 10, and so we get that this is equal to 15 for problem number eight. Number nine, we've got a complex fraction problem. If we do that direct substitution first, we would have a, a zero for our x here and a zero for our x here. So we would have one over one minus one over zero. That is also zero over zero. So we've got that indeterminate form again. It's a common theme in this, uh, this section. Um, so what do we do? Well, we've got these complex fractions. The goal here is I need to combine these two terms together, but I can't do that unless they're the same denominator. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this as the limit as x approaches zero of one over x plus one minus, this is one over one, right? One is the same thing as one over one, and that's still all being divided by x. Now, I need to get a common denominator. So here, I'm gonna technically take whatever this denominator here is and multiply it over here. That's, you know, just one, uh, multiplying by one and multiplying by one. Here, I'm gonna take this denominator, I'm gonna multiply it in both of these places. So this is gonna be multiplying by x plus one times x plus one. Again, the reason why I'm doing this is now look at that denominator. I've got one times x plus one and one times x plus one. Now they're gonna have the same denominator and I'm gonna be able to combine them. So this gives us the limit as x approaches zero of one over x plus one minus x plus one all over uh, also x plus one all divided by x. Now again, these have the same denominator, so we're gonna combine the numerators together to give them one fraction. So this is the limit as x approaches zero of one minus x plus one, all divided by that x plus one, all divided by x. And then we're gonna see that we've got a one minus this one that's right here. So those ones are gonna cancel, and I'm gonna be left with this limit as x approaches zero. Do you notice that I'm writing the limit statement for each of these values? The limit stays with the problem as I'm doing my work until I actually evaluate that limit. It is an actual important step to be writing that limit along the way. And you'll notice that as I've been doing this, I've been doing this all the whole time that way. Um, so we've got this negative x in that numerator where it's being divided by x plus one. Instead of writing this divided by x on the bottom, I'm gonna re rewrite that as a multiplication of one over x. So again, key piece, this divided by x, dividing by x is the same thing as multiplying by one over x. And now we can see here that uh, our x's are gonna cancel with that numerator and denominator. So this is gonna be the limit as x approaches zero of negative one divided by x plus one. There is nothing left for me to cancel, so we're gonna go back to that direct substitution. We're gonna plug that zero in, and we get that this is equal to negative one over one which is negative one for problem number nine. All right, let's move on to 10. Continuing with this review, looks like we've got only a few more left. 
Um, so if f of x is equal to sine of x, tangent of x, and cosine of x for these particular values on our domain, find the following. All right, we want the limit as x approaches negative pi from the left side. So I notice that there's a negative pi on these values. From the left means it's less than. So I need to find the value uh, for this. This is going to be sine of negative pi. Sine of negative pi, if we were going to do that, uh, is going to give us zero for that one. So sine of negative pi is equal to zero for that one. For B, they're asking us the limit as x approaches just negative pi of f of x. We did negative pi uh, from the left side. If we're going to find it with no exponent, we also technically need to consider what the limit as x approaches negative pi from the right side is going to be. Because if we're going to do the overall limit, it's going to take into account both of these. And so from the right side, we're going to use this equation because this is the x values that are bigger than negative 5. And so that's going to be uh, using tan, essentially tan of negative pi. Tan of negative pi is going to be equal to 0 as well. Uh, actually, so that's equal to 0 as well. And so because we can see here that the limit from the left is 0 and the limit from the right is 0, that means that this overall limit is 0. So we've got our first two answers, A and B, for that. Uh, what about C? Well, they're saying the limit as x approaches pi over 4. Well, so if we're doing pi over 4, that's going to be, we notice that from the left, values less than uh, pi over 4, we're going to need tan of x. From the right, we're going to need cosine of x. So I'm going to consider both of those really quickly over here, just showing my work. The limit as x approaches pi over 4 of f of x is going to be, uh, if we're doing it from the left side, is going to be tan of pi over 4. It's going to be tan of pi over 4. And so if we're going to do that, uh, tan of pi over 4 should give us uh, 1. So that's 1. And then if we do cosine of pi over 4, so if we do the, uh, I'll do, yes, I'll do it up here, sort of running out of room. If we do the limit as x approaches pi over 4 from the right side of f of x, that's going to use the cosine function because those are the values that are bigger than pi over 4. And so that's going to be a cosine of pi over 4, which should be, uh, let's see, cosine of pi over 4 should give us root 2 over 2. Um, and what we see is that those two values for the limit from the left and the limit from the right are not equal to each other. Um, and so since these two are not equal to each other, that means that this overall limit over here does not exist. It does not exist for that value of C. All right, D, they're just asking us what f of pi over 4 is. We need to find the part where it's actually equal to it. Well, that's the cosine of x part. And so we actually did cosine of pi over 4 already. We said that that was root 2 over 2. Uh, and so that's going to be this value right here, root 2 over 2 for D. All right, on to the graphical part. Let's do this using the graph that they gave us. The limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. Well, if I go to 3, I see that from the left and from the right, it's going to a height of 2. So that's going to be 2 for this. Uh, for number 12, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. Well, here's 1. And we see that the function from the left is going towards a height of 4. From the right is going towards a height of 4. So that's going to be our limit for number 12. Number 13, they're asking, what is f of 3? At 3, they're not asking a limit here. They're just asking, what's the output when x equals 3? There doesn't appear to be anything filled in. So because of that, I'm going to say undefined for number 13. For number 14, f of negative 2. At negative 2, again, no limit here. They're just asking what the output is. We're looking for the filled in circle. Hey, that has a height of negative 2 for number 14. Number 15, we've got the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x. Um, at 2, there's no like filled in circle or open circle, but the line is here. So this is technically a point on the line, even though it's not highlighted like this one is or like this one is. This is still the, the point and this is still the limit. From the left, it's going towards a height of 3. From the right, it's going towards a height of 3. And it appears to be continuous. So that's got to be the limit and the actual point here. Uh, that is going to be 3 for that one. That's going to be our height of that function. Number 16. 
The limit as x approaches negative 2, but from the right side. Here's negative 2 coming from the right side. That appears to be going to a height of 2. f of 1, what's the output when the uh, input is 1? That looks like that is has a height of 2. Not a limit there, just the actual output. And then here, number 18, the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left side of f of x. Here's our negative 2 coming from the left. It appears to be going to a height of negative 2 for that one. So that is uh, our graphical ones, our quick review for that. Number 19, let g and h be the functions defined by g of x uh, as listed and h of x as listed. If f is a function that satisfies g of x and f of x and h of x, uh, that these are g of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to h of x for all x values. What is the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x? Well, in this case, just from the setup of this, the fact that they gave me these three functions and they said that f of x was being sandwiched between these two, uh, this looks to me like this is going to be like the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem for this. And so let's start with the initial uh, proposition for that. If we write this actual function, so, so we know that g of x uh, is less than or equal to this. So let's write out what the functions that they gave us. I got negative 1 fourth x squared. Uh, I don't know why I put parentheses there. So negative 1 fourth x squared minus 1 half x minus 9 over 4. That's going to be less than or equal to whatever f of x is, which is less than or equal to sine of pi over 2x minus 1. Now, if this is true, then we should be able to take essentially the limit of each of these pieces and hope we're going to hope that the limit on this side and the limit on this side are the same. If they are, that means that this one in the middle has to be as well. So what I'm going to technically do is I'm, I'm doing the uh, limit as x approaches negative 1 for each of these three pieces. Each of these three are going to have that limit. And so what is that limit as x approaches negative 1? Well, so we've got negative one-fourth of negative one squared minus a half times negative one minus nine over four. I also have sine of pi over two times negative one minus one. Uh, on that left side, if we evaluate this, this looks like that this is going to simplify to be negative two, which should be less than or equal to whatever the limit as x approaches negative one of f of x is. And if we evaluate this, uh, this should be negative 1 and then minus 1. This is going to also be negative 2. Now we notice that this limit has been sandwiched. It's been squeezed between negative 2 and negative 2. If it has to be less than or equal to negative 2 and greater than or equal to negative 2, then this is, has to equal negative 2 by the squeeze theorem. So I will just say by squeeze theorem. we know that the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x is equal to negative 2. I really like these problems, uh, these squeeze theorem problems, because we just found this limit of this f of x function, and notice that they never actually told us what the function was. I don't even know what the function is. All we know is that this one, one uh, g of x and h of x are above and below it, and we're able to still find the limit. It's pretty cool. All right, we are now on our last problem for this problem number 20. Uh, if f of x is equal to x squared plus 10x plus 21 uh, divided by x, x plus 3, create your own table of values to help you evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 3 of f of x. Now, if I were to plug in negative 3, we would, we would be uh, dividing by 0. We can see this is undefined. So the way that I want to do this, uh, especially since they're not giving me values, is my x values are going to be close to negative 3. Right? I, I'm trying to find out what this limit is. I don't know. Um, so I'm going to do some values that are slightly above it and slightly below it. Here are the values that I would pick. I'd pick like negative 2.999 negative 2.99 and negative 2.9. Those are all values that are slightly larger than negative 3. And then I'm going to do values that are slightly lower than negative 3, like negative 3.001, negative 3.01, and negative 3.1. 
Um, next, I'm gonna use my calculator to evaluate these values. A reminder for you, if you are using your calculator to do this, please, please, please make sure that you are putting parentheses around that numerator and then dividing and then putting parentheses around the denominator. There were a lot of us on that first quiz this year that got some table values incorrect because you were not using parentheses when you put this into your calculator. If you do that, uh, you should get these values. So I got 3.9 for that first one, then 3.99, then 3.999, and then 4.001, 4.01, and 4.1. If we're thinking about these limits from the left side, this looks like it's going towards four. From the right side, going towards x equals negative three, this also looks like it's going towards four. So I would conclude that this limit uh, as x approaches negative three of f of x is equal to four. That's it for our mid-unit review for uh, chapter one. Uh, check out our video for chapter two and please reach out to me if you've got any questions. Have a great rest of your day.